Well, good morning, everybody. Man, so excited to be here. We've had an incredible week here at Moore Church. Last Sunday, we had the men's shootout. All the dudes showed up, 110 guys showed up for the men's shootout, so don't mess with Moore Church. Don't mess. So, man, it was super fun seeing all the guys hanging out. Uh, so fun to celebrate and see all that God's doing. Not only in the women's, we got a strong women's ministry here at Moore. But, man, the guys are coming. There's more for the men of Moore Church. And so super excited to see that. Uh, last Sunday, uh, we also had party with the pastor uh, at our North Campus. We have it all the time. About once a month, we have party with the pastor. And last week, we gained 26 new partners. Come on, 26 new families that are a part of what God's doing here at Moore Church. We celebrate that. Then uh, I got my boy, uh, Aaron, to up here talking about Easter, getting me all excited. I was in the back getting excited. I can't wait, two weeks, 14 days. It's coming, it's coming. Easter is only two weeks away and uh, it's, it's all coming together. We're gonna have two services, 9-11. We're gonna have a petting zoo. Come on, y'all love the petting zoo. Got some like pigs and goats and stuff and they smell, but they clean them up before uh, the petting zoo time. Uh, we've got the Enrique Express. We got a train. We've named the Enrique Express. I don't know how it got that name. Enrique named it, I think. And so uh, we're gonna have three different family photo areas. And so you can get family pictures out there. And so, you know what I love is that families still use their family photo from more church on their Facebook profile for like years. I've been seeing some of y'all use that for years and so excited about that. Uh, we're gonna have kids walking away with a dozen Easter eggs. Every kid is walking away with a bag full of eggs. So mom, you're welcome. We're gonna hook them up with some sugar before we send them home with you. We're gonna do something brand new, new event. We created our staff brainstorm. We created a brand new event. We're gonna have a station that we're called, it's called the Deviled Egg Toss. Deviled Egg toss get ready i'm not even gonna tell you you're gonna have to show up to find out what it is i'm super excited about that one now why do we do all these things and why do i tell you about it we do all these things and i tell you about it so that we can use them as tools to invite people who normally wouldn't come to come and show up we don't just do it because it's fun though it is fun we do it as a tool to reach people who are far from god and i'm telling you that on easter i'm telling a story that jesus told that's gonna change people's lives. I'm telling you, I'm about to tell a story in a way that nobody has ever heard it before that's gonna help people understand who God is. We have this idea that God's this big angry guy in heaven looking to get us for messing up. We think that all God does is remember our past. We think that God is looking to pin on us the mistakes that we've made, but the Bible tells us that God is full of grace and mercy and love and forgiveness and redemption and not condemnation. And so not only are a bunch of people gonna get saved on Easter Sunday, but they're gonna step into a new understanding of how much God loves them. The question is, are you gonna bring somebody? Thank you, thank you. Are, are, you, are, are you gonna just come and receive and take your photo and throw the egg at the devil? And are you, oh, see, I told you what we're doing. And so, are you gonna do that? Are you gonna come and worship and take your picture in your nice little dress? You girls got your poses all figured out, right? Are you, gonna, are you gonna do all those things but not bring somebody along? Our job is to compel people to come in. And so this week, let's not let people that we love miss out on the opportunity of hearing about the love of God our family members, our neighbors, our coworkers, our friends, the random dude pumping gas across the thing at the gas station. You're sitting there just draining your bank account like your 401k is disappearing while you fill out the tank. Talk to the dude over there, he's crying too. Hey, you need Jesus, bro. I'm saying, compel them guys, 14 days. It's gonna be good, don't let, miss, don't let people miss Easter at more church. Can I pray over Easter? I know we're still two weeks out, can I pray? God, we know that you love the world. That's why you sent your son. That's why we celebrate Easter. And Father, as we're 14 days out, I ask that you would help me and Rachel and Lillian and Titus to reach our worlds. And I ask for the people of Moore Church that you would help them over these next two weeks to reach their worlds. That we would understand that we're not just going to work, we're not just going to school, we're not just going to the grocery store, but that we are the light of the world and that you can shine through us and change people's eternity. Let us take it seriously, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Come on, man, I feel good. I feel good today. We're still in our series, Legacy of More. I gotta say, I'm super proud of y'all because Pastor Whitney, we have not had an attendance dip. We've done great. A lot of times, 
She said, first time ever. You know, you guys have been, been here. You said, you know what, Pastor? Scoop some manure on me. I'll take it. Come on, scoop it on. And so I'm proud of you for being here and being engaged uh, over the last four weeks. We've learned a lot of things. The first week, we talked about the valves. Had my big uh, science experiment contraption here. Talked about the valves. And I said that if God can get it through you, he will give it to you. Right, right. That if God can trust that you will allow your currency to flow in and out, that he'll bless you. Luke 19, 26, and it says, and to those who use well, those who use well, what they are given even more will be given to them. We talked about that the first week and asked, what are you doing with the valves? Are we intentional to turn it on for God and not only keep it on for us? What are we doing with the valves? Then the next week, Pastor Whitney knocked out of the park and we learned that if God clothes the lilies of the valley, he will clothe us. That if God feeds the birds of the air, he will provide for us. That God wants to meet our needs. She taught out of Luke 12 and said, for life is more than food and your body more than clothing. That God understands the needs of our life and that he has more for us. And then last week, last week, how many were here last Sunday? Last Sunday, we went to what I call Prop City. We went to Prop City last week and we talked about some Doritos. Remember, we talked about Doritos. You open a bag of Doritos and it's only half full. But the Bible says this about our generosity. Luke 6, give and it will be given to you. A good measure, not a half bag, but pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your laps. Then we talked about the idea that the measure that we use is the measure that will be used unto us. And I read Mark uh, 42, Mark 4, 24, sorry. And it says, with the measure you use, it will be measured to you and even more. And so I brought my big uh, backhoe bucket out on stage and talked about the idea that we get to pick our level of generosity, that how we give is what the Lord says he's going to give unto us. It's right here all throughout the Bible. Jesus teaches this idea. We talked about how uh, your harvest is proportionate to what you sow, that if you only plant one seed, you only grow one plant. So we talked through that last week. I think that that was uh, really good. One of my favorite things we did last Sunday is we talked about the idea of progressive sanctification. Y'all remember? That when you ask Jesus in your heart, that doesn't mean that you have to have it all together that day. And so uh, this week, it was played out greatly uh, within our staff. Uh, Whitney uh, was at the church working, and uh, I don't know what happened. Whitney carries like eight bags. She has like eight bags and three coffee cups at all times. And so I don't know exactly what was happening, but she somehow got her finger slammed in the door uh, at the church. And, uh, and I'm just sitting in my office, you know, praying or whatever I'm doing, praying or something. And I hear Whitney down the hall yell out in full power. <laughs> she yells out, Shiznits! <laughs> And I'm, I'm like, what did she just say? And so I stick my head out in the hallway and I'm like, you okay? And she's standing there like, I did it. And I was like, you did what? And she's like, progressive sanctification. <laughs> she slammed her finger in the door and instead of yelling what she's been yelling for 30 something years, she took a step. <laughs> she took a step. <laughs> Shiznits! Good job. Good job, Pastor Whitney. Oh, man. You know, really, the Bible, it tells us that we need to be working out our salvation. We're working it out. It's not like you pray a prayer and then you're perfect. I still live in a body made of flesh and my flesh wants to do things my spirit knows it shouldn't do all the time. And so it's, a pro it's progressive, man, that we're growing in our relationship with God. And that's true in our profanity usage. <laughs> but it's also true in our generosity. A lot of times when we teach about money as pastors, we only talk about the 10%. We only talk about the tithe. And that can feel overwhelming because that's too big of a step to take. Like, pastor, there's no way that I can give 10% of my income. That freaks me out, bro. You're killing me. Well, take a step. Take a step. It's, it's progressive. And so last week, we talked about this idea of uh, progression. And so last week, we built a staircase, the stairway of more. 
the stairway of, of more, to the more that God would have. And so if you are a Christian, this is something that you need to understand. And there's, there's a couple different types of givers. First, there's the never giver. The never giver is somebody who attends, but they never give. The offering bucket goes by and Pastor Aaron prays for it and they go, eh, that's, that's not for me. And if you just ask Jesus in your heart, you've only been coming three months or six months, that's cool, chill, sit, it's not for you. But at some point, the next step in your relationship with God is to say, hey, I'm not just gonna be a never giver, but I'm gonna engage. You know, at Thanksgiving, we all have that one uncle in our family. You all know that uncle. Dude shows up late, don't bring nothing with him, eats three helpings, and then be digging to steal your Tupperware to take some to go. I'm like, you couldn't even bring some chips or a two liter, bro? No, just taking all the leftovers. And I think that at some point in our relationship with God, we have to just not always walk out with the Tupperware, but we have to walk in with something. And so we have to take a step from becoming a never giver into coming, becoming a if giver. An if giver, an if giver. An if giver is someone who gives if they're here. If they're not busy, if they're not out of town, if they didn't sleep in, you're going to have to amen me from heaven today, Lord, that, that, <laughs> that if they didn't sleep in, but if they're here, they're going to give if they feel like it. If the music like really moved them, if Pastor Trustin made me cry, if these things happen, then I'm going to give an if giver. We talked last week that if givers are God tippers. The only reason you give a tip is because you're at a location. If I don't go to Chili's, I'm not gonna give them a tip. But if I'm there, I'm gonna tip the waitress. And my tip is dependent upon the service that I receive. If givers are God tippers. And so we, we go from never to if givers to then we become a something giver. I'm gonna give something, which is a huge step, man. Where you say that I'm not just gonna give if I'm there, but God, I'm gonna have some consistency in my life. I'm, I'm gonna give something. God, I'm going to pray or I'm going to look at my finances and see what I have the faith for. And I'm going I'm to give something to you. And a lot of you have taken this step over the last number of years here at Moore Church. And I'm super proud of you. You prayed and said, God, I'm going to give $50 a month or $100 a month. Thank you for that. Heaven applauds your progress. But I want to just encourage you to let's not just give out of ease. Let's give out of faith. Let's not stall out in our journey in the steps of more into obedience of what God has, but say, God, I don't want to only give something, but I want to give out of obedience. And then we have the next level of a giver is what we would call an all-in giver. An all-in giver. This says, God, I want to be all into what your word says and all into your truth. And this is a huge milestone in your faith. It's huge. This is huge in your Jesus journey to say, hey, God, I want to be all in with my finances to be able to give what you've told me to. The Bible says this in Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. All in givers, they believe this. It says, bring the whole tithe, that's 10%, into the storehouse. That's where you're fed from. So that there may be food in my house, so that we can rent a petting zoo on Easter. So there can be food in our house, so that we can do things to reach people. God says, test me in this says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open, throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room to store it. There will not be enough room to store it. The Bible says you got to build more barns to be able to hold the things that God wants to do. That, that God says, I love the verse that he says, test me. Test me. Take the step. I know you're here, but feel me out. Test me in this thing and see what I do. Because you know, the truth is, the tithe is a test of trust. It's a test. The tithe is a test of trust. So I want to ask a couple of people to come and help me. Uh, Wyatt and Colby are somewhere. Wyatt and Colby, would you guys come out? Are they here? Okay, here's Wyatt. Okay, and Colby. What's up? Give him a hand. Okay. So come up here. Come up here. So Wyatt uh, is going to represent you. Everyone say, hi, me. Okay, so Wyatt, you stand right here. Now Colby, uh, what's up? Colby's a big old boy. I went to youth group and they made me like wrestle this dude. It was not a good experience for me. And so Colby, come stand right here. Now Wyatt, we're gonna test you. So turn like this. Okay, Colby, turn like this. Let's take a step back. All right, put your arms out. Okay, Wyatt, I need you to trust Colby that he's gonna catch you. Okay, so Colby, put your arms out. Oh, he, oh, look, no, okay. No, 
no hesitation. I didn't have to count to three. I didn't have to do nothing. Why it was ready, he trusted Colby to catch him. But I saw Katie here. Katie, come here, Katie. There's some steps. We put some steps in here. Come here, give it up for Katie. Okay. Now, Katie, you come stand right here. Okay, come, can, Katie, stand right here. Now, okay, turn like this. Turn like this. Now, put, you put your arms out. Okay, now, Wyatt, you turn like this. <laughs> okay, ready? Go. <laughs> what happened? She's too small. She's too small. She, she's too small. The tithe, the tithe is a test of trust. So let me ask you a question. For your faith, how big is your God? How, how big? How big is your God? Because for me, when I think of God, he's a lot bigger than Colby. Colby's strong and mighty and powerful, and he can catch when we test him. But the reason that we're unwilling to take the step to do the thing that's a little scary is because maybe deep in our heart, God isn't as big as we amen that he is. Thank you guys, you all are great. We've gotta make a decision to say, hey God, I'm gonna be all in. I'm just gonna clap and shout and amen, but I'm gonna believe that you're big enough to catch me when you say to trust me. So we have to make uh, some steps. And what happens is, is when you continue on the staircase of more, and when you stand here long enough as a all-in giver, God increases your capacity. He increases your, your business grows. You get a new idea that brings increase into your family. You, have, you step into a situation of investment that you never would have found out because when God can get it through you, he can get it to you. And so when you stand here long enough, maybe it's only a month or maybe it's 10 years. I don't know, that's up to you and God. But God says, hey son, hey daughter, now I'm gonna step you into more. And now you have a capacity to do more than you ever could. You know there's people at Moore Church that now tithe more than they used to make? I'm not making it up. They tithe more than they used to make because they took the steps of obedience and faith to trust God. We have to move into more. When we have this capacity, it doesn't hurt the same way that it would previously. A more giver. So last week, at the end of service, we passed out a card and I asked you to take that card home and look at it and pray about it and chew on it so we could turn it in this week. And at the end of service, I'm gonna ask you to fill that card out and turn it in. There's not a number on a card. A lot of times pastors do these like financial series. I've done it before and I may do it again someday. But this is not about a number goal. This is about a heart goal that we would as a church all start to trust God in a new way. I'm gonna ask you to fill that out at the end of service, but before I do, I just wanna teach one more idea. I said this last week and I really wanna focus on it. I said that it's not about the amount that you give. I know that people can get offended when pastors talk about money because they think that we're trying to pull an amount out of you. I'm not trying to get something from you, I'm trying to get something to you. It's not about an amount that we're giving because God is not concerned with the amount. He's not concerned with the amount. He's concerned with our trust. He's concerned with our obedience to what his word says. God doesn't care about the amount, man, but we as people, we as people, all we care about is the amount. If you go and apply for a new job, the first question you're asking is how much? How much are you gonna pay me right now before I come to work for you? We wanna know about the amount. We're all like, show me the money, right? Money, 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 right? It's all about the Benjamins, baby. It's all about the money, man. We, we as humans, in our thinking, we think it's all about the amount. When my daughter opens up a birthday card, she doesn't care what you wrote in it. She only wants to see if grandma gave her a 20 or a Benji, right? And me as a grown man, I read the words after I peek at what's on the check, right? 
We are concerned about the amount. Y'all know you do the same thing. We're concerned about the amount. I got to get my piece of the pie. How big is my slice? Do, am I getting enough? But God isn't focused on the amount. He's focused on our obedience. He's focused on are we trusting him? We care, we care, I care so much about our portion, our portion, our portion of the pie, what it is that we're getting. And as I was praying for you this week, because I pray for y'all all the time, by name, by family, by situation. Sometimes as staff, we just open Facebook pictures and we just pray over the needs that are in the house. As I was praying for you this week, God spoke to me and he said, trust them, they need to understand, I don't care about the portion, but the proportion. God doesn't care about the portion, but the proportion. God doesn't care about the amount, about how much you give. You don't know why God doesn't care about how big his slice is? Because he's not hungry. If we're having pizza and you cut me some measly little slice, I'm going to be upset because I'm hungry. But God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Your generosity is not about hooking God up. It's about standing under his blessing so he can hook you up. He's, he's not worried about your portion, but he is aware of the proportion, the percentage. The proportion we give, it shows our trust, our dedication, our obedience to God. He doesn't care about portion or amounts because we all have different amounts. We all make different amounts of money. We all have different jobs. We all come from different families. We all have different things that we do. We're all older or younger. They're different things. We all have different size pie. Right. We all have a different size pie. And so God doesn't care about the amount, but he cares about the portion. You know, some of us, we only make a little bit of money. And some of us make a little bit more money. And so what we have to do is we have to look at our pie and we have to say, hey God, I'm gonna be willing to give you a slice of my pie and say, hey God, I, I, I trust you with all that I have. But the same thing is true for somebody who might make just a little bit more money that yeah, the slice is bigger, but God doesn't care about the portion. He cares about the proportion. He cares about your obedience to step into what he's called you to do. And some of us in this season right now after COVID just make a little bit of money. We don't even make a small amount of money. We're right now living in that personal pan life. You know what I'm saying? Right now, numbers have went down and we're just living in this little tiny portion of a season. And some of us, uh, started like a mask company and we sold masks or something on the internet or we sell gasoline, I don't know. And right now we live in blessed. And so we just have favor upon favor. And so we got more money than we've ever seen in our whole life. And so we just have all of this provision that's been coming in and dude, can I just tell you, have you guys ever been to Serious Pizza? It's serious. This, this, the, 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 some of us, this is where we're living in life right now. Listen, I'm going somewhere. God doesn't care about the portion. He cares about the per portion. God says, I don't care where you are. I want you to trust me. I don't know where you are this year in your finances, but I want you to trust me. Maybe things are going really poorly. Maybe they're going really bad right now. And God says, but I want you to trust me. And maybe you're living under an open heaven and you've been blessed and God says, I want you to, that's it. Hey, that'll blow your diet for a month. I had to ask somebody else to go and pick this up so I would not eat some last night. Real talk, progressive sanctification. And so we, we have to understand that God is not concerned with the portion, but the proportion. But the danger is, as we're blessed, what we do is we say, hey, God, thank you for blessing me. Thank you for blessing me, God. Thank you that I'm living in abundance. And so here's, here's what I'm going to do. I wonder what should be good. Well, when I was back living this life, this is what I gave. And so now what I'm going to do is this, this just feels absurd, God. 
This feels absurd to give this. So you know what I'm gonna do? I know that I'm living in this blessed life, but let me cut you a piece. Because I'm still doing real good. I'm still giving a big amount. Man, do you, do you see what I gave last year? Talk about it at a life group, man. I, you can't believe how much I gave. And God's in heaven saying, I don't care about the amount. It's not about the portion. It's about the proportion. Because you don't have to be rich to be all in. You don't. You don't have to be wealthy to be a more giver. You just have to say, hey, God, with what I have right now, I'm going to trust you. With what I have right now, I'm going to trust you. That we would say, God, I know that it feels like a lot. I know that it feels scary, but I'm going to step into the more that you have for me. Because where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. But the danger is, is that as our pie grows, our heart just starts getting added to other things. It gets added to the season tickets, and it gets added to the lake house, and it gets added to the boat, and it gets added to the sports cart, and it gets added to all of these fashion things that we step in. I'm talking to myself too, y'all. It's easy that we add our heart to all of these other things, but we have to remember who should get the first slice of the pie. The first fruits of everything that God would bring into our life that we would return to him. God doesn't care about the portion, but the proportion. So, if you're doing well, don't cut a small slice and trick yourself. And if you're doing bad financially, don't trick yourself and say, it doesn't matter anyways. This is such a little meager amount. Pastor Trustin said that the rent at Willie Pig is $14,000 a month. Wow, that's a lot of money. I'm only giving so little, it won't even help. It's not about me. It's about you standing under obedience of God's provision for you. We have to understand that it's about our proportion. We have to ask ourselves, do we trust him or do we only trust us? I'm good at trusting me because I know how to work hard. I know how to work hard. I know how to get stuff from A to B. I can push the ball down the field. But there's some moments that I have to say, hey God, I can't trust my power, I have to trust yours. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna fall into your arms and believe that you're big enough to catch me. So over this four weeks, we've shared verses from the Old Testament and the New Testament. I've shared personal stories and testimonies of the church and people in the house. We've given visuals and illustrations. I believe that the Holy Spirit has been tugging at your heart, but after all of the teaching, the real question is, do you trust him? I'm going to ask you to fill out a card and turn it in today and circle a box and write a prayer request on it. The question is, do you really trust that God can do what he says he's going to do? Do you trust him enough to cut him a real slice? This idea of proportion versus portion is not just a cute alliteration I came up with. It's good, though. (laughs) It's not just an alliteration that I came up this week in my office. It's, It's something that Jesus teaches us. He shows us. In Luke chapter 21 and in Mark 12, we see an interaction that Jesus had in the temple. And so Jesus is in the Jewish temple, and I want to show you a picture of what the first temple would have looked like. It's beautiful. There are all these different courts in the temple. This far outer court on the outside is called the Gentile temple. Gentiles are people who aren't Jewish. This is where they could come and worship. It's where they would come and worship have community. Then there's the next courtyard. It's the one right there in front of those steps. That's called the women's court. That's where the women were allowed to go, and that's where they would worship. Then you would go up the stairs, and up the stairs through those doors was the men's court. That's where the men were allowed to go and be taught. And then inside those doors is the holy place. That's where only the priests could go. And so Jesus is teaching in the temple. But it's really interesting to me where Jesus is teaching. Because usually all the teaching would happen only in the men's court. But Jesus was standing on the steps in the woman's court. 
because Jesus understood that there were giftings in both genders, and so he's teaching to both groups. That's good. And I also find it a little interesting that it's in the women's court that they placed their giving boxes. Because the ladies can't be in ministry, but they can give their money. It's how it used to be. It's how it used to be. And still is some places. So Jesus is standing there and he's teaching. He's telling some stories. He's helping the people understand who he is. And, uh, and Jesus wraps up teaching and he calls all of his disciples to come over to him. Now I'm going to read it and then we're going to talk about it. Mark 12, 41. It says, Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were being put. And he watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, big portions. But a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Jesus is teaching. He sees this play out. And then he Jesus calls his disciples to him, and he says, hey guys, come over here. And he tells the disciples, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has given more than all the others who are making contributions. For they gave a tiny part of their surplus. (laughs) But she, poor as she is, has given everything everything she had to live on, portion and proportion, an amount and a heart that's dedicated to the Lord. And so in these women's courts is where they had the giving boxes, a lot like we have today around the room. They looked a little bit different. They would have not been made of wood or square. They would have been the shape of like a, a trumpet. There were this metal horn that you would, like a funnel that people could put money in and it would fall down into a box that was locked down to the bottom. And so I want to walk through this and I want to illustrate for you what Jesus was teaching. Mark 12, 41, it says, Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put in. So Jesus finishes teaching and then he removes himself and he just starts observing. It says, and he watched the crowd put their money into the temple treasury. He's positioned himself out of the way. He's not interfering, but he's watching. He's observing. You know, God's still watching what we do in our lives. The Bible, it says in 2 Chronicles 16, that the eyes of the Lord search through the whole earth to see who's faithful to him. Jesus is sitting there. He's watching this dramatic moment unfold in the temple. Verse 41 goes on. It says, many rich people threw in large amounts. In that day, all of the currency was coins, metal coins. And they were throwing those metal coins into that metal horn and it would have made a lot of racket. And these people of prominence would sashay into the temple in their flowing robes with their gold coins jingling in their bags. And they would wait until everyone was looking and they would come and make a big display as they would pour out their coins unto the Lord. They were giving great portion, but questionable proportion. It says many rich people, many rich people, not just one. Now the Bible doesn't tell us what the internal dialogue of these people was. But we're all thinking something while we're doing it. The Bible doesn't tell us what these wealthy people were thinking, what they were chewing on, why they were doing what they were doing, but I really believe that they were having a internal dialogue. Go. Oh, I'm gonna go give. Uh, 
I see you, baby. You like this, don't you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Look at me go. Woo. Woo. Look at me put some money in the offering. Oh, yeah. You like that? There it is. Woo. I gave. There it is. All that I'm saying, all that I'm saying is that if I don't get to go to Costa Rica after this, we're gonna have some issues, you got it? Okay, now everybody, say hashtag giving. <laughs> All right, everybody, we're gonna say at Tristan Baba, at um, Rachel Baba, come on, at Whitney Barth, um, and oh, we can't forget the best for last, at Aaron B. Barth. All right, everybody. Okay. All I do is win, 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 no matter what. Got money on my mind, I can never get enough. And every time I step up in the building, everybody hands go up. <laughs> hey, there you are, pastors. Hey, that's get yourself something nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. My accountant says that is a tax write-off. So it's literally the least I can do. <laughs> There's plenty more where that came from so don't you worry about me guys don't you worry about me and so Jesus is sitting in this moment with his disciples watching now we've modernized what would have happened but these people are making a display of their generosity and in their hearts they're hoping other people are watching in their hearts they know that what they're giving doesn't actually cost them anything. They understand that it's the least amount they can give to at least have a show in front of man. It doesn't cost them anything. Yes, they might be dumping in bags of gold, but it is nothing compared to what they actually have. Jesus gathers his disciples over in the corner of the temple to just watch this happen. Then Jesus sees another person who's getting ready to come and give. The Bible tells us this giver is a woman. And this woman is poor, she's actually a widow. She's lost everything that she has. And in this day, women could only find resources through their men's jobs. Mark 12, 44. But a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. The story doesn't tell us what she was facing but I can imagine that it was out of a heart of desperation. Lord, I don't know how I'm gonna do it. I don't know how it's gonna work, but I know that you can do it. Lord, it's not much, but this is all I have. Will you take this little bit and will you touch someone like you've touched me and will you change their life like you've changed mine? I love you, I trust you, I believe you will. This poor widow, she's in a moment of desperation. And she comes after these people literally shot money around the room. And she says, Jesus, I'm going to give the best that I have. It's a really small piece of pizza. But I believe you will. I believe that if I step out in obedience to do what you've called me to do, that you can do exceedingly, abundantly, above all I could ask or imagine. Now this is my whole sermon, this next part. Mark 12, 43. After this, Jesus called his disciples to him and he said, I tell you the truth, which Jesus never lies. He's emphasizing what he's about to say. I tell you the truth, guys. This poor widow has given more in heaven, has given more than all the others who are making contributions. For they gave a tiny part of their surplus, but she, poor as she is, has given everything she had. She gave a smaller portion, but the greatest proportion. 
we don't know what happened in her life after this. <laughs> the Bible doesn't follow her journey, but I can imagine that something great happened. I have a sneaky suspicion. And as she gave as a poor widow, maybe she's thinking about the widow in the Old Testament who didn't have what she needed. But when she was obedient to feed the prophet, to give him a little piece of bread, that then the Bible says that the oil and the flour never ran out in her home. She's remembering how if God did it for her, she'll do it for me. You see, the miracles that God does is not just in a pastor's life. It can be in your life. That God's blessing does not run out on just a few. He has unlimited resource over us. And so she steps out and she gives all that she has. And I don't know what happened, but I'm gonna meet her someday. And so are you. And she'll be able to tell us the dire situation that she was in. And then she'll be able to tell us what happened the next day. She'll be able to talk about how the floodgates of heaven opened. She'll be able to talk about how a new opportunity that she never saw came into her life because she stepped out and she was faithful. You see, God will take what the enemy meant for evil and turn it for good if we let him. If we let him, man. If we'll put our difficult situation into his hands. She saw everybody giving. And she probably stood there and looked at her two small copper coins and thought, this isn't going to matter at all. But she gave it anyways. Our amounts are different, y'all. Our amounts are different. The cars in the parking lot are different. The homes that we live in, the bank accounts are different. They're different. They're different. So I'm saying it's not about the amount. It's about our willingness to trust God in where we are today. If we could only have faith like the widow, God could do something incredible in our lives. I like how this verse is written in the message version. It's another translation of the Bible. It says this in Mark 12, 44. All the others gave what they would never miss. It didn't cost them anything. But she gave extravagantly what she couldn't afford. She gave her all. She said, God, I'm all in. You know what 10% is? It's an amount we miss. It's an amount we miss. Rachel and I tithe every month for our whole marriage. And if I'm running the budget, I miss the number. But I don't miss the blessing it puts me under. We have to make a decision. Are we going to be obedient enough to trust God to give him something that actually costs us something? I like that this story took place in the temple. In the temple. The woman gave in the temple. Jesus teaching in the temple. The temple was positioned on top of this big hill. It's beautiful. It's covered in gold all around the top. You could see it for 30 miles made of white marble. It's beautiful. But there's a reason that they built the temple where they, where they built it. It's because hundreds of years ago, pre the, even the building of the temple, there was a guy named David, <clears throat> who was the king, the dude who killed Goliath. Well, after he killed Goliath, he still had a lot of battles to fight because there's always more than one giant in our lives. And so he's in this battle and he's losing. He's sinned, he's messed up, he's far from God, he's now losing his men or being killed, and he says, God, I'm sorry. He has a repentive heart. And God leads him to this hill, and on this hill, there's a farmer that owns it. And the farmer on the top of this hill has what's called a threshing floor. It's a wooden floor that they would bring their grain on, and you don't have to separate the, the wheat from the chaff, the, the, like the wrapper of the wheat. So they put on this flushing floor on top of this hill and they would beat the wheat and the, the chaff would blow away in the wind. That's why they did it on the top of the hill. And David goes to this guy and he says, farmer, I need to make an offering for the Lord. Can, can, can I buy some of your oxen and can I buy this wooden floor to burn it and give it to the Lord? And the, the farmer says to the king, you can have it for free. That's the hookup, right? That's pretty great. Okay, cool. I need to make an offering. You're going to give it to me for free. It's not going to cost me anything. But look at what David says. First Chronicles 21.2. David says, no, 
I insist on buying it for the full price. I will not take what is yours and give it to the Lord. Here's the verse. I will not present offerings that have cost me nothing. David is in a desperate situation. He's in a desperate situation. And he says, I have to give to the Lord and it better cost me something. And this idea of the poor widow, I don't want the mighty men in the room to get confused. Because us giving our best is not only for the poor and the lowly, it's for the mighty kings who have killed giants. That no matter where we are, no matter where we are, we have to give to the Lord something that costs us something. And so there was a card in your seat today, the one you came in. And my hope is that when you look at that card, you would actually start to think about, am I gonna trust God? I know you took a step years ago. What's the step today? I know that gas is expensive. I know that there's layoffs. I know, I know that things are tough. I'm not asking you to do what the widow did and put in every dollar. Don't be broke. But what's the step that you feel God's asking you to take? And I think for many of us, it's time to step into trusting God with a tithe. It's hard, man. It's scary. It doesn't always make sense, but our God is faithful. You can clap that up. I, I know, I know, man. I know you think you can't afford it. But I'm telling you, you can't afford not to give. Rachel and I can't afford not to give to the Lord because he's been so good to us and he's blessed us beyond what we could have ever imagined. And so on the card, it's real simple what's written on the card. It says this. At the top it says, I believe he will. And so I want you to take a second. I want you to think throughout the rest of this year, what do you believe in that God will do? Heal your marriage? Bring back a son or a daughter who's far from the Lord? Bring increase into your business? Open a door for you in a new career? I, I don't know what it is, it could be anything. I believe that he will, and I want you to write it down as a prayer. As what Pastor Tim said, I'm stepping into victory. That I'm stepping into, I believe that this is what God has for me. I want you to write down what you believe God's gonna do. And then it says, the step I'm taking today towards more is, and then circle one. You don't have to put a number. And if you wanna write me a note, write it. I'm gonna read it. If you wanna write a note to me, if you wanna say something, you can write it on there. And I want you to circle which step that you're taking. And my ask is, is that you don't just do it on the card, but you do it with the bank. My hope is that before Easter Sunday, two weeks, that you'd actually take the step. Take the step. Set up the auto draft. Set up the recurring giving. Go on the website and set it up. If you don't know how, talk to your small group leader. Ask somebody to help you figure that out. It's easy, but we'll help you. So you can take that step into all that God has. And then on the back, we just want your name and your address. Because what I want to do is I want to take these, I want to mail them back to you in six months. I want to mail them back to you. You're going to be, you're going to be blown away at what God does. I'm telling you, trust him and see that the Lord is good. Watch him open the floodgates of heaven. You're going to be blown away at what God does. So, in the seats are the cards and a pen. If you don't have a card or a pen, you can raise your hand and the usher will get you one or you can find one on a seat next to you. The band's gonna lead us here for just a minute. And then I'm gonna ask some of our leaders and pastors to come and they're gonna be ready to receive your card. And then we have a gift for you. Back by popular demand, everybody's been asking. We got some magnets for your refrigerator that say stepping into more. Stepping into more, stepping, stepping into more, stepping into the progression of my relationship with him. And I want you to take that home and put it on your fridge and remember that you're saying, God, I'm stepping into the more that you have for me. So the band's gonna play. I'm gonna ask our pastors and leaders to come with the, receive the cards and give out the magnets. And when you're ready, 
when you're ready, we're not all gonna come at once. When you feel like, God, you spoke to me, I'm ready to come turn my card in, I want you to stand up, and I want you to come down to one of our leaders uh, and give. Could we all stand all across the room this morning? Could we stand as we prepare to make this commitment to the Lord? Don't anybody leave yet, we're not done, we got one more thing. So I want you to fill it out, and when you're ready, I want you to come and give it to one of our leaders. God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for caring for us. And today, as we make a decision to make a step, we ask that you would bless us in Jesus' name.